that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. I get this picture of mountains melting because of the presence of God. Uh, we've had the opportunity. We lived on the big island for some time, a couple of years, and and I've seen it before, but there's the active volcano that's there. And you can literally see areas. Um, there's, the, there's the main crater that you can go to, and you drive to it, and so it's elevated, but you'd never know that it's such a, uh, it's more elevated than than other areas, except for the for the cold of it. And so, when it was Christmas time, we would go to that area to get our Christmas cold weather, so we could put a hoodie on, and then we would leave, and then we'd come back down to where we were in the uh, sea level, and then we'd be in our shorts and t-shirts and stuff. And so, on Christmas Day, uh, but we'd go there, and and we'd see the volcano and the. We literally would see lava flowing, and there would be rivers of lava, and I think of mountains melting. When I, I, that's what I think of, something like that, a, a sight like that. Uh, but God's got the power to create. He's got the power to melt uh, mountains. And it says in verse number 2, As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the folks here gathered and, and making your word a priority in their lives. Lord, I pray that you'd richly bless them. I pray that you'd speak to their hearts. I pray that so we'd be tuned in with you, Lord. I pray that you'd start with me. And uh, Lord, may I lead my family uh, may, I, may I lead others as well. But God, would you prepare our hearts for what you have in store in these next couple of days? Would you do miracles, I pray? Would you, would you uh, just glorify yourself uh, through it all, through us? Lord, may we be usable vessels, vessels unto honor, vessels unto your, for your glory. And uh, Lord, help us this evening in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> of course, this is a different time frame. Uh, in the Old Testament in a different dispensation that God did not permanently indwell his believers. He came upon them and, and uh, they caused them to do uh, feats. His power was still uh, in them when he did that, uh, on them when he, when he did that. Uh, however, there's still a great application as we read uh, in this passage uh, this evening. And uh, I believe our, our hearts should long for revival in our homes, our hearts ought to long for revival in our churches and in our land, in our nation. Uh, I'm excited that it seems like there may be light at the end of the tunnel for this whole Roe versus Wade uh, in the federal level to finally cease, to finally be overturned, and uh, the preservation of uh, uh, at least a decline in the six, 63 million, is it 63 million? Uh, babies that have been murdered, and we've just, I think, have have become become accustomed to this since since the 70s. You know, it's just a natural part of life that we've become uh, accustomed to receiving, and uh, you know, it's it's the law of the land. It's the law of the land. Well, uh, laws can be prayed down. God can melt mountains, and I pray that this would be one of those mountains that gets melted and uh, that God would be glorified through it and uh, his, his holiness and his justice, uh, but then also his mercy uh, would, uh, would be revealed here. And so we need God. And uh, earlier in Isaiah's prophecy um, here, he reported in Isaiah chapter 1. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. book of Isaiah talks about revival in different capacities. There's revival in the islands. Uh, there's revival um, here in this passage, uh, a call for revival, a call for righteousness and to, to tune in to Almighty God. And in Isaiah chapter 1 in verse number 4, we read here, we need God to fix our problems. We need God to fix our uh, land, I, I think it's, um, we ought to pray for uh, those, in authority, those in authority, we ought to pray for proper people, godly people to be in authority and, and make decisions. Yes, 
Uh, but uh, I think the, the, we're well beyond the point of man and politicians uh, to where we just keep complicating things and doing things uh, wrong, even with the best intentions. Um, and I think at this point, uh, the more of man we have, the more in trouble we become, but the more of God that we absolutely need. And Isaiah 4, uh, 1 verse 4, it says this, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no, uh, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. If we didn't know Isaiah was addressing ancient Judah and Jerusalem, uh, you would have thought he was addressing and talking about our nation. Uh, you'd have thought he's talking about present Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Babylon and, uh, and uh, talking about America. Well, this, the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 94, he says this in verse number 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity unless the Lord had been my help. My soul had almost dwelt in silence. And in Psalm 127 verse one, uh, the, the, uh, God reminds us, he says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. And so this evening, as, as we consider this idea of revival in our hearts, uh, revival, not necessarily in that you need to get saved, but if you're here and you're not certain that heaven is your home, today is the day of salvation. Today, uh, make it that uh, you choose Jesus as your personal savior. So you have that promise of, of a home and eternal life in heaven uh, with God. You can know that heaven is your home, but I'm talking about the saints of God here uh, this evening, uh, those of us that have become calloused uh, to uh, the things of God, those of us that have become numbed and our, our senses have been dulled uh, to sin, perhaps. Uh, we need revival. We need, to, we need to see ourselves for who we are uh, before a holy God, and we need to get right with Him so that we can be in tune with Him and, uh, and have uh, Him as our, as our uh, guide, as our God um, uh, daily. And so this evening, as we prepare for revival, we see when will God come down? When will God revive us? When will we see a great movement of God, of revival within us? I'm going to give you several facts I believe we see from this passage here of when God comes down. When will God come down? I believe these are requisites to God coming down. I believe these are prerequisites to God, uh, to, to revival in our hearts. Number one is this, when we begin to fear him. When will we have revival? When we begin to fear God. When we begin to see him for who he is. Isaiah said he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He wasn't just his buddy. He wasn't just his, uh, his, uh, his companion. But God is all of that. Yes, but God is holy and God is just and and uh, God can't look upon sin. And so God sent his son Jesus to be the propitiation uh, for our sins. We need to see God for who he is. Uh, we need to begin to fear him. We need to look to fear him. Look at verse number two of Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 again. It says that the nations may tremble at thy presence. That the nations may tremble at thy presence. Now, it can sometimes be hard, I think, to understand this. Um, the Bible says to come boldly before the throne of grace. And we, uh, we ought to approach uh, uh, God um, boldly and confidently as we're one of his children. But the only way that we can do that is through Jesus. Jesus gives us access to be able to go before a holy and just God. And so without Jesus, we are nothing. Without Jesus, we have no avenue, no, no door uh, to God the Father. We read in Isaiah 
It says the nation, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. We've grown far too accustomed uh, to things as they are. We need a shaking. We need an awakening. You've heard of the revivals in, in uh, the New England states. What were they called? The great what? Great awakening. We need a great awakening of, of spiritual things. We need a great awakening in our hearts of, of revival in the things of God. We need an awakening. Sin has dulled our senses, and we've become tolerant, and we've become accustomed uh, to uh, the things of the world. In the great Hebrides revival of 1949 and 1952, it's the revival uh, where the man Donald Trump uh, uh, was, was named after, actually. There was a man, and I believe, I don't believe it was the preacher, uh, but there was a man named uh, Donald, and, and there's a YouTube clip. How many have seen that YouTube clip? Um, it talks about Donald's Bible. Uh, but there's a revival at this time here, and, and uh, there were a couple of old ladies, and one of them was a relative of Donald Trump, I believe, and a couple of older ladies, and, and they were looking to call a preacher or a pastor uh, to preach at a little church, and, and, uh, and they were praying. Every, every, every day they were praying. They were seeking revival. They were seeking God, and, and they were praying. And as they were calling a man to come and pastor them, uh, they, they thoroughly questioned the man, making sure that he was right with God. Are you right with God? Are you in right fellowship and communion uh, with the Lord? And before they called him, before they let him preach, they made sure that he was thoroughly confessed of his sin. And uh, it's, it's an interesting little clip there. You got to uh, Google it, Google uh, Donald Trump's Bible. And, and I believe it's Clarence Sexton that, that uh, teaches on it there. And, and anyway, long story short, what happened was there was revival. Uh, God used the praying ladies uh, to, to, to cause the New Hebrides revival. And uh, they saw scores and scores of people saved. And, and I believe it was what sparked the, uh, uh, the, uh, the New World uh, great awakening revivals that were to come, and uh, but uh, but uh, after it all uh, was said and done, there was a Bible. The Bible that the preacher preached with uh, was passed down to one of those ladies, and one of those ladies happened to be the mother of Donald Trump, and she came across uh, to the New World, and and uh, supposedly Donald Trump has got that Bible in a, in an office somewhere in some some place special, and he was named after the man that uh, was used of God, one of the men, one of the characters that was used of God. And I believe Donald Trump, needs, Donald Trump needs to get into the Bible. He says it's his favorite book, but he had a hard time uh, quoting a uh, favorite scripture or anything uh, like that. But, but uh, the fact of the matter is there was a literal shaking that took place as a result of these ladies and uh, the, the men praying for revival. And I believe God will meet with those who don't take his presence lightly. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 and 2, uh, where, uh, the, uh, were the verses that those Scottish people were claiming in that revival. Isaiah 6, verse 4 tells us this, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In Psalm 103, the Bible says this in verse number 13. It says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. We need the pity of God. In Psalm 103, verse 11, just a, a verse back, it says this, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. His mercy is great to those that will fear him. Psalm 85 verse 9 says, Surely his salvation is nigh to them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. What is the fear of the Lord exactly? It's interesting that Ron sent me a text about halfway through the week and just out of the blue. And the Lord had put this message on my heart and was developing it. But he said this, it, occurred, it has occurred uh, to me that the fear of the Lord, I think I got this word for word, it occurs to me that the fear of the Lord is hard to distinguish from submission to God. I think there's, there's 
a lot of truth to that. Uh, but what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord. There are several instances where the fear of the Lord, uh, where the Word of God tells us what the fear of the Lord is. And uh, uh, Strong's defines the word fear as this. He says, uh, uh, as awesome or a terrifying thing, respect, reverence, or piety. That's the definition from the Strong's Concordance. But I want to give you several scriptures here. Um, let's see, several scriptures here. Why don't you turn with me? Uh, actually, turn to Proverbs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface you here with another psalm, but turn to Proverbs beginning in chapter number one. Proverbs chapter number one. And we're going to do a little study here and go through the references where it talks about the fear of the Lord and the benefits of the fear of the Lord. And so what is the fear of the Lord? What is fear? It's awesome or a terrifying thing. It's respect or reverence or piety uh, to a holy uh, and just God. Psalm 111, verse 10, it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding uh, have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Now look at Proverbs chapter 1 and in verse number 7. Proverbs 1. Let's read it together out loud. Ready, begin. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Turn to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. I was talking with uh, my friend Josh Ewan. Many of you know him. He, he frequents here sometimes, and, and uh, he bought a home actually in Salt River, Salt Creek area, your old subdivision there. And and uh, the, the, the way he does purchases some of these homes, and he'll flip them, fix them up, and sell them or, or turn them over to a uh, wholesaler, sell them at a wholesale price. Um, oftentimes, there are people that, man, they're just simple people. They don't realize that, uh, uh, so somebody had been behind on the mortgage for, uh, for some time, and and uh, was able to get the contact information of the homeowner and, and uh, reached out to the uh, homeowner that the home was about to become a foreclosed, go, become a bank-owned home, and reached out to him, and he's like, he's like the home's already bank-owned, and uh, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, it wasn't, and uh, Josh was able to, to, uh, to help him so that he didn't have to take that negative hit on his credit and buy the home, and then they'll invest some money into it, he and his company, and then they'll uh, resell it, and uh, it benefits both people. It benefits the person that had the home, obviously. They don't have to take that negative credit hit, and then it, uh, it benefits, obviously, them as they sell the home and are able to make uh, somewhat of a profit. But uh, in talking to that, there are just people that are, that are, that are, that are simple, and they, they don't understand. Uh, there was a little argument that... Uh, there was a washer and dryer. There were some appliances in the house, and, and the people had a certain amount of time to get out of the house. And uh, before they were, they were going to come in, you know, obviously start cleaning it up and remodeling it. And uh, then uh, they had left the appliances, and Josh ended up selling the appliances uh, to somebody that will repair them. And the lady had texted him and was heated, was cursing him out, and why did you sell this? That's mine, and this and that. Well, that person literally had probably close to a year to get all their stuff sold and, and uh, plenty of time to get their stuff out of there. And it's just astonishing, the, the simplicity of it, the simple-minded, how you can be so offended about, you know, an appliance, yet you lost your home. You know, such, so much more of an investment there that, uh, anyway, um, it talks about knowledge here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Josh was, did uh, actually give the money back uh, after he sold the appliances. He ended up uh, being the better person and giving the money off the proceeds to the of the appliances uh, to the person. And so I was proud of him for that. I don't know that I'd have done it, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Turn to Proverbs 9, Proverbs 9, just a chapter over, and then in verse number 10. 
And so we see specifically here, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is. Now, verse number 10, let's read it together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Who is the holy? God. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom of wisdom. And uh, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And some benefits now of the fear of the Lord. And some of these are the fear of the Lord is. But what are some of the benefits of the fear of the Lord? Turn to chapter 10, Proverbs 10 and verse 27. 10, verse 27. Let's read it together. Ready, begin. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Look, turn to uh, chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 26, and then also we'll go right into 27. Ready, begin. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Uh, turn to chapter 15 and verse 33. <clears throat> verse thir 33, ready, begin. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Turn to chapter 19, chapter 19, and verse 23. Ready, begin. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. And then Proverbs 22, verse 4, I'll read it. It says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. When will God come down? When will we have revival in our hearts when we fear the Lord? And then there are many benefits to the fear of the Lord as well we see. We see uh, we see long life, prolongeth days, strong confidence, a fountain of life uh, to depart from the snares of death, the instruction of wisdom before honor is humility. The Lord tendeth to life by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. The Bible says, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. That's the kind of lifting up that we need. None of that corporate, you know, climbing the ladder stuff. We need the humility, the lifting up that comes from humility as we humble ourselves before the Lord. Uh, when will we see a great movement of, of uh, God, of revival in us when we fear him? I want to ask you this evening, do you fear the Lord? Do you fear God? What do you mean by that, Pastor Sam? Well, we just read how to fear the Lord. We just read what fear is. Uh, do you hate sin? Do you love righteousness like he does? Uh, do you look to submit and, and please him in all your decisions? Are you looking to him as he's high and lifted up? Secondly, when God comes down, when will he come down? When will we experience this revival? Number two, when we expect the unexpected. When we expect the unexpected. Now, that's kind of a weird phrase, but there are several scriptures that, that I think allude to this idea. Look at verse number three. Verse number three, Isaiah 64. He says, when thou didst terrible things, which we looked not for, thou camest down. And I don't think these uh, terrible things, when we think terrible, these are not uh, bad things things uh, to the person. These were awesome things. These were uh, uh, things that had uh, people uh, confounded, dumbfounded, and uh, just in awe. And uh, I believe we need to, uh, let's pray for God to do whatever he wants to do. Let's pray for God, not put him in a box and, and uh, try to control his workings. Uh, but uh, the only way I think that we can, we can expect him to work is uh, when we fear him and then when we uh, expect the unexpected. Let's let him do what he wants, even if it's not in accordance to our premeditated or preconceived plans. We can't put God in a box and we can't constrain him to what we want. Oh, but he, he, 
He operates within the realms of the word of God. I don't want you to get uh, freaked out with me saying some of these things here, okay? And so uh, we need to be praying, not my will, but thine be done. Let's claim Jeremiah 33, verse 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I think of Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. When will God come down? When will we see revival? When will we have personal revival? When we expect the unexpected, when we fear the Lord. Number three, when we take the initiative to seek God in repentance. In repentance. That's a kind of a, a word that um, we don't, it, 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 repentance brings, brings about like a negative connotation to it. But it shouldn't be that way in a Christian's life. It shouldn't be a, a negative word that we look to and, and avoid. Repentance ought to be frequented, frequent, frequented, done frequently in our lives. We ought to seek repentance daily. We ought to seek repentance as soon as the Spirit of God. I talked to the uh, in the, the lesson this morning in Sunday school. I talked about the time where. I stole a plum from the grocery store, and uh, oh, I, and Holy Spirit told me not to. I defied the Spirit of God. I took the plum, and I got outside, and my mom said, saw that I had this uh, plum seed, and she said, where did you get that? I'm not going to tell this story. <laughs> and uh, marched back in there and, and uh, told the grocer, and um, and it was an embarrassing situation, and um, but all because I uh, I didn't yield to the Spirit of God, and I needed to repent and uh, and get right with Him as I had done wrong. We need repentance frequently. Yes, we're forgiven if we're saved, and we have a great identity in Jesus Christ. Uh, but with uh, uh, the the best we have to offer Him, our best is only filthy rags. The phrase in verse number seven, it says, stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Isaiah chapter, uh, that's uh, 64 verse seven. It tells us that God desires us to take the initiative. Another verse that's re that reinforces this principle is James chapter four. Uh, turn there, James four verse eight. Turn there, please. James chapter four, we're almost finished here. We see the account here of drawing close to God, drawing nigh to God. Verse number eight, he says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. Weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and let your joy uh, turn and your joy to heaviness. Then he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift. You up. What is the requisite of revival, a prerequisite of revival? It's being right with him. It's repentance. It's confessing uh, that sin that has barricaded uh, a pure and right relationship and uh, restoring a right spirit, renew a right spirit within me, humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord, uh, asking the Lord, Holy Spirit, would you search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me? Would you reveal that to me, Lord, that I can, I can I identify it and confess it and restore a right spirit, restore a, that right fellowship that, that I, I desire to have with you. As Christians, we ought to be ever so sensitive to the spirit of God. Uh, spiritual wise, we should have the mentality of, uh, uh, we shouldn't have the mentality of, of, of like a rawhide mentality. I think it's good to have a, for men to have a, a physical rawhide mentality of, of toughness and, and, and strength. But when it comes to the things of God, I think the, the strongest of men are the ones that are so ever so sensitive to the spirit of God and the correction of God and uh, the filling of the spirit of God. And uh, that's what God desires from all of his children, spiritual sensitivity. May we, may we learn to teach our young people to be sensitive to the things of the Spirit of God, sensitive to the things of the Word of God. We ought to be 
uh, we ought to learn to distinguish between stuff tough spiritually and physically and sensitive spiritually and, and physically. And I think the way to be sensitive spiritually is to keep short accounts with Him, to keep short accounts with God. Every day as I wake up, I need to get with God. God, would you search my heart? God, would you fill me? God, would you help me to put your armor on that I can face the wiles of the devil? Help me to be a spirit-filled Christian, a uh, spirit-filled husband, a spirit-filled father, a spirit-filled pastor. May I be yielded to you all throughout the day. And when it, the time comes and, and I, I've, I've, I've given in, I've, I've neglected uh, the Spirit of God, I've grieved Him and I've, I've, I've sinned, oh God, would you forgive me of that sin? Would you help me to be right with you? I, I confess that, that uh, whatever it may be, that, that anger, I confess that um, bad thought, I confess whatever it is, and, and then help me to get in tune uh, with Him. Restore a right spirit within me. We see... Lastly here, when were there, will there be revival? When will God come down? Number four, when we place ourselves at the mercies of God. When we place ourselves at the mercies of God. Look at uh, Isaiah 64 and then verse number eight. Verse number eight, the prophet shows us our need to recognize God as our father. And then earlier in Isaiah chapter one, uh, verses two and three, um, actually, I didn't want you to, to turn to Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah 1 again. Verse 2. He says this, he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. God is talking about his children, uh, the Israelites, the Hebrews, and uh, they've rebelled against him. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Uh, How can we expect to have revival? When will we have revival? When we place ourselves at the mercies of God. The same anger, the same angst is expressed in Malachi chapter uh, 1, verse 6. It says this, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Uh, When we give the Lord the honor and the glory that's due to him, we'll then receive the benefit of the verse that we just read. And in Psalm 103, verse 13, says this, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. I need God's pity. I need his grace. I need his favor. I need his blessing daily in my lives. And this truth here, it's found in uh, 2 Corinthians in the New Testament as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17, a familiar passage It goes like this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I'm convinced we need to humble ourselves before the Lord in such a matter that if God says to do this or do that, we obey Him fully. We obey Him, we submit to Him, And uh, we just go along with it. Why? Because God said it. God said it. Thus saith the Lord, no matter what the results are, God said to do it, I'm going to do it. You know, we read Old Testament stories and and, uh, we see, man, those people had great faith. What they were, I think of uh, Abraham and Isaac, right? Taking your kid up and God said to sacrifice his kid. I don't believe... God would do that today because he's confined to, uh, well, I hate to use the word confined, but he uses the boundaries of his word. And and, uh, God wouldn't want us to take and and offer our kid. The sacrificial system is done, first of all. uh, But the Isaac, that faith, uh, the the faith that Isaac had uh, to follow his father up to the mountain there and to be willing to be that sacrifice. Why? Because God said to do it. 
and they place themselves at the mercies of God. Do we place ourselves at the mercies of God? I think of Job. Listen to this. Job was the most righteous man in the earth uh, at the time in his outlook uh, 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 early on in his trials. Uh, he lost seven sons and three daughters, was it? Or two daughters, three daughters? Seven sons and three daughters. And, and his statement was, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But in uh, Job chapter 13, uh, verse 15, his response was this to God. Uh, his response about God was this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job was saying this, even if this path that God is leading me on is the path to my own destruction, I'll still trust him. I'll still follow him. I'll still submit to him. Why? Because he's God. Why? Because I'm at the mercy of God. Why? Because I fear him. I trust him. I know that without him, I'm nothing. I know that anything good that I am is because of him. And I fully need him. Our duty isn't to dictate to God what he must do, but our attitude must be, Lord, do what's best for me and that which brings glory to you. Actually, ultimately, that which brings the most glory to you. And this is the essence of the attitude of the humble. Isaiah 57, verse 15, he promises us this. He says, uh, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's what we need. When will revival happen? When will we be revived? Uh, when we are at the mercy of God, when we place ourselves at the mercy of God, when we humble ourselves, when we seek Him, when we fear Him. When this is done, a mountain or the mountains of unbelief and the carnality that we have become accustomed to, that will all be melted in the manifested presence of the Lord who is pleased with our absolute surrender to Him and to his will. That's what, how revival is going to take place. And it starts with me. It starts with me. If I'm going to have revival, it starts with me. Isaiah 64 verse 1 says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow uh, down at thy presence. When will God come down? When will he meet with us in, a, in that spirit of revival? that uh, we so desperately need. I think these are just a few of the prerequisites to it here this evening. Uh, may we look to him, and uh, we're going to have a time of invitation. It's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to start it off uh, a little bit differently, but I want to encourage everybody to take some time in prayer, and let's seek the Lord. Maybe, if it's, whether it's individually, if you want to grab your spouse, your children, a friend, I want to encourage you to come up to this altar I want to encourage you to say, Holy Spirit of God, God, would you search my heart? Would you help me to humble myself? Would you reveal any sin that there may be that is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, clouded my relationship, that has distorted my relationship with you?